Um, hello everyone and welcome back to NL582 modeling and control of electric machines and drives. Um, in the last lecture we were talking about a recap on AC circuits in both single phase and three phase and we started by the end of the class talking about the three phase systems the three phase uh, sources loads lines and everything because actually as we talked last time is just how the public grid is basically all in three phase so the generation happens in three phase so our generators are typically are three phase generators they are generating power in three phase and then the transmission is happening in three phase so we transmit it at three phase and then at distribution level we when you're talking about the larger loads or the industrial loads they are mostly three phase loads and if we go even to domestic loads, if they are higher enough, they also fit a three phase. Otherwise, they're just connected to a different phase as a single phase home. So if it is a, our appliances at home is not very big, or it is a very big home, you know, so it will be just single phase, but it will be connected. So different homes will be connected to different phases to keep the load uh, distributed evenly across these phases as much as we can. Because if you remember what we talked about last time, we are trying to keep the uh, three phase system balanced as much as we can and balanced means they are those three phase if they are as voltages or currents we try to keep these magnitudes um, uh, uh, equal between the phases so as you see here this phase A, phase B and phase C um, those phases as you see we have just given them so that's VA, it's V cosine omega T plus theta V and it is the same magnitude V across the all three phases so that's why we are balanced three phase systems and they have um, fixed um, phase difference it's uh, 120 degrees in degrees or in radians it's 2 pi over 3 so I see here that is 2 pi over 3, 2 pi over 3 that's what we call about a balanced three phase um, system whatever it is voltage or current as we can see and we're talking about a balanced load that means the impedances of the three phases are equal that means we have a balanced load because if you apply a balanced voltage to an equal impedances between the three phases that will give you balanced currents so it will give you uh, currents in each uh, phase of the loads are equal in magnitude okay uh, we talked about this last time and we have given this idea about token and we just said that we have two different connections for the three phase system we're talking about here the y connection sometimes we call it star connection whatever you want to call it so the other one is the delta connection so we started talking about the y connection last time the y connection is basically are connecting the three phases for having a common point in between them and this point we call it the neutral point it's just here and also here okay so that is what is characterizes the Y connection or the star connection that you have a neutral point and the system or the phase system is connected to the outer world through the remaining three points like that and also from here this point and this point and this point were connected to the lines okay so these are the lines that are connecting them line A and line C and line okay and also the neutral point is connected to the other neutral points that we see here by the neutral line that means for the wire connection we have four wire systems because we need three lines and one neutral okay guys and this gives us a rise about that we have phase quantities and line to line quantities or we call them line quantities okay guys that we talked about the last minute about the last lecture the phase quantities are basically the quantities associated with a single phase of the three phases that we're dealing with okay so i'll be talking about a phase voltage that means the voltage difference across your phase so i'll be talking about something like phase a here okay that means the phase voltage of phase a means the voltage across this phase that means the voltage difference between the point a dash and the neutral point okay that is VAN or VA dash N, whatever you want to call it. Okay. And the voltage across phase B will be VBN. The voltage across, v, uh, across phase C will be VCN. Okay. 
On the other hand, the line to line voltage from its name is basically the, the voltage difference between a line and another line, okay? That means it's from A to B, or B to C, or C to A, so it's VAB, or VBC, or VCA, whatever you want to calculate them. So the idea of calculating them is basically you can use the original Kirchhoff voltage rule, okay? So if you want to calculate the line to line voltage here for a star connection or light connection, that is VAB, as we told last time. Okay, from here, from the basic character voltage law, it will just give you VAN minus VBN. Okay, so to get the line to line voltage in a Y connection, you basically um, subtracting uh, two phase voltages. Okay, you can ask me, just very obvious, if we said that's a balanced three phase system and that means the voltages are equal, so you are saying if I subtract VAN minus VBN, it will give you zero. Don't ever forget that we are talking here about complex numbers. We're talking about polar form. So this line to line is a polar form. That's polar form. Everything here is polar form. So those are just magnitudes and angles, not just magnitudes. Okay. So you are subtracting VAN, which is have a magnitude and angle minus VBN, which is a magnitude and another angle, because they, both of them has different angles. They have a phase shift of 2 pi over 3, and that means you will not subtract them to give you 0, okay? And from what you see here, the last time we did this also, I line here, the current moving through the line would be the same as the current moving through the phase here. So in a Y connection, I line equals A phase, okay? So in a Y connection, I line equals I phase, sorry, I line equals I phase, while V line does not equal V phase. Okay, guys? And we give a hint that for a balanced three phase system, the um, summation of the three currents, which gives you the neutral current, will give you zero if the system is balanced. So if you're talking about a completely balanced three phase system like that, that means there will not be any current moving through the neutral line. Okay? If any impellence happen, that means there is they are not typically balanced, they're not hundred percent balanced, that means they have a slightly different magnitude or their phase differences are not exactly one hundred and twenty degrees. That means you will have some amount of current moving through this neutral line. So actually in a system and everything you can check if your system is balanced or not by trying to measure the current moving through the neutral line. If it is zero, that means the system is 100% balanced. If you have current moving through it, that means the system is not 100% balanced, okay? As we said on Y connection, that is the line to line voltage does not equal the phase voltage. But rather than if you try to calculate it, like what we said, for example, VAP, which is the first line to line voltage, can be calculated like equals VAN, which is the phase voltage of A, minus VBN, the phase voltage of B. If you work out the math here, it will give you that the line to line voltage here will be having a magnitude which is uh, square root of 3 times the magnitude of the phase voltage, and you have a phase difference of 30 degrees between them. So that means if, for example, here your VAN just an example here, I have VAN, something like that, will equal 100 and angle of 10 degrees. You can directly calculate VAB, which is a line to line voltage, don't forget that, it will equal square root of 3 times 100, that will be the magnitude, and your angle will be 10 plus 30. So that is 100 square root of 3, and the angle will be 40 degrees, okay? Then, if I need to work out the other line voltages, what should I do? It's very simple, because we said we are talking about a balanced system, okay? So, for a balanced three-phase system, VBC, which is the, just the next line-to-line -line voltage to calculate, will be having the same magnitude as the VAB, because they are also balanced, even with the line-to-line -line voltages, okay? And the angle will be the angle of VAB, which is for 40 degree, and you just subtract 120 degrees. Because there is still a balanced three-phase system, that means they have equal magnitude and 120 degrees phase difference. Do not forget that. So that is 100 square root of 3 
and the angles are just here minus 80 degrees okay but in the meantime also we need the third one which is VCA remember that's some sort of a clock so it's ABC so we need to find the lines that means VAB and then VBC and then VCA not VAC okay so VCA equals 100 square root of 3 the same magnitude because they are balanced okay and you get the last one minus 80 and you subtract another 120 okay and that's give you 100 square root of 3 and the angle between this will be minus 200 degrees okay guys they're all in volts yes so that's the basic idea of all of that so that means if you if the system is balanced and you know just one voltage one phase voltage one line voltage you can work out all the other phase voltages and the line voltages pretty easily just knowing this relationship between the line to line and the phase voltage in the y connection okay guys um, using the same idea we can jump now to the second connection which is the delta connection okay guys and the delta connection it basically if you having a three-phase system whatever it's a load or sources when you connect them in delta it's from its name they are just connected in a triangle like that okay and those are your points a b c and those are your lines connecting them to the outside world okay so that is line and that is a line and that is a line okay meanwhile that is a phase and that is a phase and that is a phase okay the same idea we're talking about loads okay so that is a source if we're talking about a load it will be also your triangle the delta okay and it will be the same idea if you connecting them like that that will be a dash b dash and c dash okay so the c here goes to c dash and this b here connected to b dash okay guys and uh, basically this you have three impedances like that and to be balanced they have to be equal so call them z delta and that is z delta and that is z delta okay that will be the same idea but now the very obvious thing to have in mind that you have no neutral point so this guy is a three wire system okay because you just have three lines to connect okay you do not have the neutral line that was out there for the y connection okay guys and you can work out the math of everything the same as we did before okay so i will just get these um loads down here to make it more clear to work on excuse my drawing okay and i will call those the same points here call it a dash b dash and c dash okay So as we said last time, we need to figure out the same idea. We need to figure out where the phase quantities versus the line to line quantities, okay? So when I'm talking about the voltages, the first here, that is the first phase. So that is phase A. And so that is the first phase and call this phase B. And that is phase C, what do you wanna call it? Or one, two, three. So if you try to work out the voltage of the phase okay so the phase voltage is the voltage across the terminals of the phase which is from those two points which is a dash b dash at the same time 
if you want to find the line to line voltage that's the first line line a and that is the second line line b and the line to line voltage is also the voltage difference between those two points looking at those they are basically the same and that gives you the information that now in delta connection v line to line equals v phase that's in polar form they're equal in magnitude and equal in angle just like the current in the y connection so in the y connection the i line equals the i phase here in delta connection v line to line equals v phase okay but if you want to try look at the current so here moves i line okay so it's the first line the current of the first line but where is the current going through the phases that is i phase a and that is the current moving through phase b and that is the current moving through phase c if you look here the current circulates around the delta so it's moving like this okay but if you look at here from point that is i line moving through here going there it will not equal the phase current it will have to be divided between those two channels between two phases as you can see okay so if you want to try to find i line or let me call it i line a just to differentiate what's happening here so i line a will equal here i phase a as a polar form they're all polar minus i phase c so in delta i line does not equal i phase so they are the opposite way so in y connection i line equal i phase while v line does not equal v phase and delta it is the opposite way v line equals v phase while i line does not equal i phase okay so if you want to do the same thing like we did before okay if you want to work out this i line for the delta if you work out the math it will give you sorry a relationship very similar to the one we found before Okay, it will give you square root of 3, the magnitude of I phase, and its angle will be theta phase minus 30 degree. Okay, so it will be the same like what we did before with the voltages in the Y connection, but here you have a major difference. This angle is minus, not plus. Okay. So if you have the magnitude and angle of the phase current, you can work out easily the magnitude and angle of the line to line current in the delta connection. Multiply the magnitude by square root of three, it will give you the magnitude of the line current and subtract 30 from the angle of the phase current, it will give you the angle of the line to line current. Okay, so it will be the same idea. For example, let I phase A equals 10 and angle um, say it's 90 degrees okay so if you want to work out i line a it will be 10 times square root of 3 and the angle will be 90 degrees minus 30 that gives you 10 square root of 3 and the angle is 60 degrees and the same idea as we did before you can work out with the other lines i line b will be the same magnitude 10 square root of 3 and you have 60 minus 120 okay if you find ilc will be 10 square root of 3 and the angle will be 60 minus 240 or plus 120 whatever you want to go they will give you the same answer okay guys so now you have learned enough about the two connection of the three phases, if it is Y connection or delta connection, 
and how to differentiate between the phase quantities and the line quantities in both of them, whatever you're talking about a voltage or current, and how to calculate one if you know the other if you know the phase quantities how to calculate the line quantities if you know the line quantities how to calculate the phase quantities okay so you should be good now with just a recap of three phase system how to work your way around them okay before i leave three phase system there is an important thing to talk about here we said that our main goal about having three phase system in our hand it's just we can transmit okay three times the power without the need to have the three times the number of wires with single phase we said that for a single phase you will have a line a neutral so if you use three different single phases you will need six wires a line and a neutral for each phase but if you use three phase system like what we did here if you use a Y connection, you will need four wires. And if you are 100% sure that the uh, system will be 100% balanced, you can get rid of the neutral wire because you basically you know that there will not be any current moving through it. Yeah, we don't do this, but theoretically you can do it. So you use three or maximum four wires in the Y connection. In the delta connection, you just use three wires, whatever the current is. So jumping from three separate phases needing six wires you can use three phases like that and you will use three or four wires at a maximum okay but can we really transmit three times the power using this that's what we need to find out so let's calculate the power in three phase system just like we did with the single phase system okay so if you want to calculate the active power go back to the last lecture we told that in AC circuits we have active reactive and apparent power P Q and S okay so the total power talking about here will be B phase A plus P phase B plus P phase C because you have three phases and each one of them carries uh, power and you can basically have them added together in a three-phase system. If you work out the mass for this, it will give you three V phase I phase cosine theta. I'm talking here about the magnitudes of the voltages and the magnitude of the current. Okay guys? And if you find out what the line quantities, it will square root of three V line to line as a magnitude multiplied by I line to line as a magnitude cosine theta. And I hope you remember the angle theta here is the phase difference between voltage and current. So three phase system can transmit three times the amount of power that a single phase system can do okay because if you remember that is the p in single phase system it was v i cosine theta if you go back to your lecture v phase i phase cosine theta okay guys <clears throat> so that is the p the same idea we're talking about the q it will also equals QA plus QB plus QC and this will give you 3 V phase magnitude times I phase magnitude sine theta as you remember from the last lecture V I sine theta was the Q for single phase like this was the Q sorry with the P for single phase okay going forward to find the apparent power S so before I go out the P is in watts just to refresh your memories and Q 
it involves both ampere reactives. And the S can be directly square root of 3. And I will call those P, that's P3 phase and Q3 phase and S3 phase, just to refresh your memory. So if you want to find the magnitude of S directly, it will be square root of, square root of 2. So the magnitude of P3 phase magnitude squared plus Q3 phase magnitude squared because you know that S is basically the complex summation of P and Q like we said the last lecture and it will be basically equaling 3 V phase I phase that I'm talking about magnitudes here if you want to find out S as a complex number, 3 phase, it will equal P3 phase plus or minus actually JQ3 phase, like in single phase. And it will equal 3V phase as a complex number times I phase conjugate. The same like last time, but now we are multiplying by 3. So the apparent power in single phase equals V times I conjugate. But we multiply by 3 because we're talking about a 3 phase system. So I want to hear the total apparent power coming from this 3 phase system. So that's how to work your road about how to find the power in 3 phase system. So you don't need to calculate the power separately from each phase and just add them together. Because if we're talking about a balanced 3 phase system, you can just find the power from a single phase and multiply by 3 and that's it. That is a P and that is a Q and that is the apparent power S. Okay guys, the apparent power is in volt amperes. So that is the idea. In a 3 phase system, you can transmit 3 times the power that can be transmitted in a single phase. But you don't need to use a 3 times the number of wires that you need in three separate single phase systems. Okay guys, so during this we talked about the AC circuit review or recap. We talked about the sinusoidal voltage and current and how to find the power from this. We talked about the principle of having reactive power and apparent power, not just active power like in DC systems. And we talked about three, and we talked about three phase systems and we talked about what means by um, balanced three phase systems and how to find out the math of them. And we talked about the two different connections of three phase system, the Y connection or so called stair connection and the delta connection and how to find out the math of the phase versus the line to line quantities in both of these connections. And we talked now about the power in three phase systems. And that's pretty much what I need you to remember or to have in your head talking about three phase systems. That we will use a lot throughout the course talking about different machines because as I said most of our machines we'll be talking about are the three phase systems so we're talking about three phase induction motors that is the workhorse of industry actually and we'll be talking a lot about it so it's in three phase I'll be talking about synchronous generators used in the typical power plants and that is also in three phase so that is the major part of the course and they are both working in three phase systems so most of the time we'll be referring to the basic principles we talked about and these um, two lectures and you'll need it a lot in your first lab because it's more or less a recap on three phase system also talking about um, uh, having transformers and connecting them to work at three phase so that first lab does not have um, a, a direct connection to the rotating machine we'll be talking about in the course but it will help you a lot just um, understand those principles we talked about in these first two lectures and it will help you a lot when you're dealing about the principles of AC single phase and three phase circuits during the work with the other machines coming in the course okay speaking of which we can now turn out to um, talk about machines okay So, 
I'm gonna now turn around to speak about general principles of uh, machines before jumping into the very first machine we will be talking about okay guys so let me now speak a little bit for the rest of the lecture about basic principles of rotating machines okay so we talked about in the introduction of the course about what we mean by machine and it doesn't harm just to refresh our memory about this okay so to keep it in mind an electric machine by definition is an energy converter okay and if I want to make it more specific and talk about rotating machine and that is what we need here I will be talking about rotating machines from its name that means these machines that contain movement rotation okay and this means is an electro mechanical energy converter that means a device that converts energy between electric form to mechanical form or mechanical form to electric form and we said that it will be having two forms okay so if your input is mechanical energy I mean here rotation what I mean by input that means you use a, an external mechanical force to rotate your machine okay so if you rotate the machine by your hand you are giving this but actually not rotating machines by our hand because our generator is very large to be done like that so we need an external force to rotate them whatever you're talking about a steam turbine a gas turbine a coal turbine you're talking about a wind turbine that uses the air to push the brushes of a wind turbine and this transmits this movement or rotation to rotate the generator or you're talking about a dam that is the water is coming from a high latitude altitude sorry to a lower altitude and from its kinetic energy transformation it just pushes these blades of a turbine and rotate it and it's attached directly to the machine and rotate it so you're talking about an external force that's giving rotation to your machine okay and this your output will be electric energy okay that means an electric voltage will appear at the machine terminals this kind of machines is the generators so the generator the machine that you give it a rotation and it will give you electric voltage at its terminals not just voltage that means we apply this voltage to a load a certain current will move from the machine to the load and that means it generates electric power like we said in the introduction there is a medium here between this input and output and this medium is the magnetic field so we need magnetic field to do this and we will be seeing in a great detail how this happens okay that is the very first kind of machines the other one is the motors and the motor is the opposite way your input here will be electrical energy that means you need to apply voltage to the machine terminal now you don't get voltage out of the machine like in generators otherwise you'll just apply in voltage you apply electricity to the terminals of the machine and by the theory of operation of the machine of how the machine works and the presence also of a medium here 
and that is the same medium which is magnetic field this electric energy will be converted into mechanical energy and that's I mean rotation of the shaft okay guys so the motor you apply electric voltage to externals and by the medium you are using which is the magnetic field this will be converted into mechanical energy and the machine will start rotating okay and what do you mean by this rotation you use it for whatever application you want okay if you attach a fans played to this shaft these fans will start rotating like a fan at your home appliance okay if you attach a pump plates to it it will work as a pump pumping up water to your home or any the industrial application if you attach it to an elevator cabin it will lift the elevator up or lower it down and now you have an elevator and very very much other applications but this idea if you apply voltage and now you have movement okay guys so that's the first principle that's what is actually a machine and what are kind of machines out there like we said in the introduction of the course we have another type of machine which is the transformers but the transformer is a machine but it's not a rotating machine and that's why it's out of a scope we are talking here about rotating machine but you have a mind that transformer is also a machine because it's an energy converter but it's not a rotating machine that's why we're not talking about it here okay the second basic principle I want you to get in your mind when talking about electric machines that rotating machines whatever it's a generator or a motor has in its basic form two members okay so if you want to have just a 2d very rough sketch of a machine it will be like that two cylinders concentric okay in the typical form you will have the other one the outer one we call it the stator and the inner one we call it the router okay why we're calling them like this because those two members one of them is stationary it remains fixed in its position does not rotate does not go anywhere and that we call it the stator and the other one is rotating that rotates around itself just like that so this rotor on the side here rotates around the shaft of the machine so the thing in the center here the shaft and the rotating member we call it the router okay guys to just have a more realistic look I will just switch you to a 3d model like this okay so this is a stator of the machine that's a cylinder as you can see here okay if you ask me about those gaps inside this one it is what we call a slots and where we will place our coils but we'll talk about this in much detail later okay but for now this guy this cylinder at all we call it the stator of the machine that thing remains stationary it doesn't rotate anywhere okay if I'll go here and let you see the router now it appears another cylinder inside if you see it here okay so this cylinder inside it is the router of the machine okay so it is another cylinder that is inside the stator and this guy rotates around its axis and its axis here is the machine's shaft okay seeing this shaft here so this shaft rotates along with the router okay how this happens it is the theory of operation of the machine I'll be talking about a lot so you have different kind of machines depending on how this happens we'll be start talking about DC machines and then we will jump by the later to synchronous machine and then induction machines they are all machines but they are have different approaches to how to convert this energies how actually from an electricity going to the machine's terminal you get a rotation of the router and the shaft or how from a rotation coming from external source external force 
to the shaft and router, you will get electricity on the terminal. So these have different approaches. And these approaches, they are all work with different kinds uh, of behaviors and we'll be studying them, okay? But the basic principles apply that you will have a stator and a router and the router rotates inside the stator with its axis with the shaft okay and now this shaft is connected whatever to it if this a motor then you connect this to the mechanical load you want to rotate you want to drive by the motor because the motor basically gives you an output of mechanical energy if it is a generator you attach to this shaft a turbine which is basically like a fan like a blade and you have an external force to make this rotate and this will transmit this rotation to the shaft and then will transmit it to the router which is rotated inside the stator and now you will get voltage out of the machine and now it works as a generator okay guys that is the basic idea i want to talk about here okay so in any kind of machine you will have two members a stator and a router and they will be separated by a gap here. This, we call it the air gap. And that's essential, okay? Because you cannot just have the stator and the router touching each other because like that, the router will not be able to rotate freely or otherwise it will have damage inside the machine. So you will make sure that you will have a little air gap between the stator and the router to let the router rotate freely, okay? And this air gap, we want to, in our design, minimize it as much as we can. And we will say why. But you have to have an air gap, so it's inevitable. We want to reduce it as much as we can, but it has to be there. Okay, guys? So, that is the second principle we're talking about here, about just basic principles about AC about machines, right? Rotating machines, we're talking about... This machine has two members, always it will have, in its basic form, a stator and a router separated between an air gap. Okay, guys? Okay. The other principle I want to talk about here is our faithful friend, who we talked about. Our medium of convergence which is the magnetic field okay we said that for this energy convergence process to happen we need to have the medium of conversion which is the magnetic field okay so how to get magnetic field so the magnetic field sources will be having two forms okay the first one is the permanent magnet Okay, and the permanent magnet can be a natural stone that's found in nature or can be manufactured right now. We can manufacture permanent magnets, but in both cases, you will have just a piece of permanent magnet like this that will be having North Pole and a South Pole. And then the magnetic flux lines will just go from the North Pole to the South Pole like this. Okay. The other form of magnets, we call it the electromagnet. What we mean by that, if you go back again to your introduction, that Faraday's uh, experiments, just he found out that if you get a piece of wire, and it will be much efficient if you wrap it like a coil like this, and if you apply electric voltage to it, that means there is a current moving through these coil turns and these turns have n turns okay this is the number of turns so a current moving through a coil like this will be an, an electromagnet just a magnet like the permanent magnet it will also have a north pole and a south pole okay that means for example, if you have a North Pole here and South Pole here, you will also have the magnetic flux lines moving around here like that. Okay? So,
So if you want to have a magnetic field, like we said, because we need a magnetic field torque as our medium of energy conversion, you will need to have either permanent magnet or an electromagnet or both of them in some machines, okay? Because those are your sources of magnetic fields, okay? If you want to talk about what is actually the difference between them, okay? Why should I choose to work with permanent magnet or electromagnet? What is the difference between them, okay? So you will be having very basic stuff to talk about when you're having the differences between those guys. The very obvious thing here, that if you're talking about a permanent magnet, the magnetic field here of the permanent magnet is fixed in magnitude and fixed in polarity, okay? That's a piece of stone that is even that's in nature like that or it is manufactured to be like that that means it will give you a fixed amount of magnetic field coming from this piece of stone okay and the polarity will remain that means the north pole will remain a north pole forever the south pole will remain a south pole forever okay on the other hand if we're talking about a coil an electric current moving through it no it's controllable and that is the greater advantage of this guy because basically the magnitude of flux can be controlled by controlling the current magnitude and or number of coil turns. So the larger the number of turns, the larger of magnetic field you can get, and the larger of the current passing, the larger magnetic field you can get. So you can increase the current or decrease the current, and now you're increasing the magnetic field or decreasing it. You can increase the number of turns or decrease it, and now you're increasing the magnetic field and decreasing it. So you can control the, the strength of the magnetic field, its magnitude or strength not like the permanent magnet, okay? And also, the polarity of flux, or the magnetic field of the flux, can be altered by um, having current and opposite direction what I mean by this here the current in this direction like this here will give you a polarity of a north and a south pole of this coil in some places okay if you just changing this polarity of the battery you're using to be like this the current will start going in the other direction like this and this will switch your north pole and south pole. The north pole will be a south pole and the south pole will be a north pole. So you can now even control the direction or the polarity of the magnetic field, not just its strength. Okay? That means it's totally controllable. So that means we can dump the permanent magnet. I'll use electromagnet all the time because it's all advantages. Okay, it's not the case. Because if you just look at this, the permanent magnet is just much simple. It's just a piece of stone I will give you magnetic field. And if you have a well design and I need this amount of flux density or this amount of magnetic field and this amount or this uh, polarity, then you can go with the permanent magnet because it's just a small piece of stone. You can put it out there and just that's it. But if you're talking about a coil, it will be much complicated because you need to find out how to wind these coils, where to place them, how to fix them well. We need to get their terminals and apply electricity to them. So there is a much headache here rather than just having a permanent magnet. Okay. So you cannot find the ultimate solution. And that is the engineering way of thinking guys. You will have to sacrifice some stuff 
to earn other points. And there is no 100% best solution. All the time you will have to sacrifice something. And here's come the engineering way of thinking is you try to maximize the benefits and reduce the disadvantages as much as you can. So if you're asking me if you want to find or can or you want to create a magnetic field in your machine, which way will go? With a permanent magnet or the electromagnet, it will be my all time answer. It depends. It depends on the application you are needed. It depends on the purpose of the machine you are building. It depends on the amount of money you can spend. It depends on the environment you are placing your machine in. It depends on very much many factors to decide which one of them to go with. Okay? And this is a design problem you will be facing throughout the course. We'll be talking about stuff like this. Okay? But to keep in mind, we have two different sources to create a magnetic field, a permanent magnet and an electromagnet. Each one has advantages and each one has disadvantages. And you have to decide which one to go with. It depends on the application. Okay. Okay, guys. So um, for here, I will just stop talking. Um, we talked about um, the three phase connections and three phase power and we started talking about basic principles of electric machines rotating machines okay um, I hope you uh, enjoyed our talking and I'll be continuing next time talking about the basic principles of energy conversion or the basic principles of machine how to build a very small machine and how actually the basic principles of electric machines working out here so thanks so much for joining me today and I will see you all next time